you know. <laughs> Tell me off good. <laughs> One father said to his son, a distracted man is a dead man, to which the lad responded, but what difference does it make? We'll all eventually be dead anyway. Ah, said his papa, but a distracted man dies 10,000 times before then and never notices. Legend says that one of the first things that happened to Adam after he left the primordial garden of physical alertness and mental quietude was that he was diagnosed as suffering from RSBUTC, reoccurring systemic bouts of unobserved transient catatonia. <laughs> A diagnosis he chose to ignore. <laughs> <laughs> Recurring systemic bouts of unobserved transient catatonia. <laughs> kind of makes you want to either think or lapse into one, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Using the word want in a very loose sense. <laughs> There was once a big machine that had billions of parts, which were all connected, but which all ran off of the machine's energy. An arrangement that any physicist can tell you is inescapable in the world of mechanics, but which men cannot fathom as related to themselves. A device of promise is stripped of potential if too soon its nature it knows. Does man not know the truth about life because of some does man not know the truth about life because of some nefarious plot or because it is not commonly in his best interest to do so If asked men perceive a difference between stupidity and self-protection but in operation the distinction blurs and is overlooked One man claims that he was abducted by aliens in a flying saucer and forced to perform weird operations on them. <laughs> Another in our continuing series, why do things always have to be the same old way over and over again? Also known as, why are some, th some non-humorous things funny if you reverse them? <laughs> Now for news from Wall Street. The body does not find surprises to be entertaining unless it paid for them. <laughs> or maybe that was news from Disney World. The essence of being especially conscious is that you see life differently from everyone else and from how you previously did. Almost the only way that the ordinary have anything to say about man is to have a complaint about him. Which is part of the situation wherein the ordinary also can scarce hear anything said about man unless it rings of criticism. Somebody answer that. <laughs> man may be the only creature who can toot his own horn, but he seems addicted to the sounds of clinkers and raspberries. <laughs> A bonus question for extra points. What future would most of man's institutions have did he not beat up on himself? And for a really big boost in your score, what future would man have? One man claims that he fell under the influence of a mad cult leader who, through subtle hypnosis and suggestion, caused him to become more conscious than he'd been. <laughs> Guess this also goes into our why is everything so predictable file. Sometimes sung to the tune of Carry Me Back to Old Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> Mythologically, men like to picture their heroes being beset by numerous villains, such as anger, greed, and gluttony, when in fact they all face but one foe, 
distraction. <laughs> the itch. The body's tendency is to scratch where the mind can't reach. <laughs> which explains most forms of entertainment. <laughs> Men came up with the idea of faith after they realized that they'd never mentally know for certain what life is about and, des and decided to go with the most pleasant possibilities. <laughs> whereas, ordin whereas ordinary people think that life can get too weird, there's always a few who wish it would get weirder <laughs> more often. The situation. When what man needs seems too far away, he'll take what's at hand. It finally struck one man quite simply. If you take the lives of ordinary men seriously, then you'll have no choice but to find fault therewith. He then began to wonder if things were, for some reason, purposefully arranged like this. On one world, everyone is born in a pool of floating dead men. But now for some less spooky news. <laughs> no one is normally aware of where they are born. So that takes care of that. Ordinary people who are impressed with their own ideas are like a man who claims to love music, but who only has one CD, which he plays over and over again. And is never aware of it. Those who talk about past lives and lives to come haven't the least idea what life is about. To be conscious in that particular way beyond what is necessary for mere existence is to be a juggler, juggling only one object. But thing is, you must keep the one object in the air at all times. <laughs> When one man was rid of his eye infection, he saw that the dead are always with us, <laughs> occupying the bodies of the living. <laughs> the Greeks didn't blind Socrates because he saw too much, but rather because he made them do so. Hey, they didn't blind Socrates. <laughs> yeah, but they would have if they'd thought of it. <laughs> The great secret work both exists and doesn't exist. It doesn't exist if you think that it exists somewhere. And then there's other way that it does exist. Talking about yourself would turn you into historical gossip while your body is still alive while simultaneously killing your mind. What really keeps the secret secret is the fact that it can't be explained to you if you don't know what it is. The height of embarrassing bullshit is a man explaining what kind of guy he is. <laughs> Here's our cartoon for the day. It's a drawing of a mystic standing up on the edge of a cliff alone, looking out and thinking. One nice thing about becoming enlightened is that it relieves you of the urge to save the world. After finally meeting Buddha and speaking privately with him, a man thought, I didn't really want to hear all this original stuff. I wanted to hear about Buddhism. <laughs> People ask if the quest for the secret is proper for them. But the better question is for a person to ask themselves if they are satisfied with their present state of dissatisfaction. No. Looking out at the vast expanse of the ocean, the Iberian king pondered, if nothing is amiss in Spain, how to get the men to sail to the new world? But he was momentarily struck. To hell with how to get them. What about me? A warrior distracted is not a warrior. 
The head of one mythical order told some newcomers, don't ever, and I mean ever, discover the truth about life unless you're really through with feeling bad and enjoying it. And someone asked, so you mean that being conscious won't actually be the end of you feeling bad? And to himself, the master thought, the initial state of recruits never improves. <laughs> There was once a race of men who felt yucky when they lived in Lapland, but a, and a bit less so when they stayed in France, and even less yucky when they camped in Kenya. And if at first you're not certain what this means, maybe you'll enjoy knowing that if it was pointed out to those involved, they wouldn't either. Hint, it starts with geography as a metaphor. I knew that would help. Men conjured up the concept of psychology after they realized that physiology was far too close. No. <laughs> the only occasion a conscious man should ever have to say I is when he says, I didn't mean to talk about myself. No. One guy was a shell of a man. Everyone is a shell of a man. Everyone is a man in a shell. And everyone is a man with a man in a shell. Aren't you glad that the body can't look around and say, what are all of you doing here? <laughs> Think how noisy things would be then. <laughs> a certain chemist has concluded privately that man is part of the periodic consciousness table. That is, that he is periodically conscious. <laughs> there was once a kingdom in which the beings divided themselves up into two groups. Those who believed that spit came first and those who believed that the wind did. <laughs> Query, why are there no firehouses in mystical realms? Because arson of illusionary structures is not possible. <laughs> On some worlds, to be more conscious than the crowd is to be like a racehorse with nowhere to run. On some worlds, the creatures can't bear to be told what they're like. So those who know will often describe it as applying to creatures on some other world. <laughs> However, if it makes you feel better, the above was not one of those instances. <laughs> or if it doesn't, it was. <laughs> the mayor, after hearing what was obtained by a listening device that the chief of police had planted in Muhammad's home, fired the man for wasting taxpayers' money. <laughs> if men could affect their mind as much as they can their body, things could be much different. And if men could affect their emotions even as much as they apparently can their minds, things would be much, much more differenter. <laughs> and if this strikes you as unclear and hard to decipher, well... That's how life likes it. <laughs> now for some intentional theme park news. How could roller coasters be expected to grow and develop? Did they realize the basic nature of their situation? Hmm. Pop quiz. Why should you never say boo to man's mental structures? Because <laughs> it might actually work. <laughs> The one surefire, guaranteed, never fail method, method to keep from becoming individually conscious is to keep beating up on everyone else and yourself for not being so. I mean, what the hell do you think mystical schools have always been for other than to teach interested pugilists where and how to profitably direct their blows? <laughs> Sucker. Looked at from a strictly mental view, you could say that a conscious man is like an intellectual who is certain of what he's talking about. 
least you forget along the way and then fail to notice that you've forgotten, be reminded that without the experience, there is no mystical quest or great secret work. There is this one planet named, let's all talk about our disabilities. And no, I don't have directions how to get there. <laughs> To, to be conscious in that special way is like being the human cannonball act in a circus, except you insist on being shot out of yourself. <laughs> Fable update, correction, and caution. Forget lions and Roman slaves and dig yourself on this. Pull someone's finger out of an electrical socket without them asking at your own peril. Certainly do not expect a thank you lick to the face. Yep. They didn't run Confucius off because he wouldn't try to help, but rather because he overdid it. One legend says that the very first mystical school established on this planet went by the name of, ah, shut up, <laughs> but was soon changed for legal and historic reasons. Which is not true, but I'm not permitted to tell you the real reason. Halt, said the border guard again. Who goes there? And this time, Lau replied, if you have to ask, you'll never know. I'm going to keep doing that one until somebody gets the mother. <laughs> and finally, the difference is that when a masochist beats up on himself, it's a hobby. But when a conscious man does so... It's business. Mm -hmm. All business. <laughs> to remind you of what I reminded you of last time we happened to run across each other. Was that no one who knows anything is going to tell you what all people would be like. And anyone who says what man should be doing. Mm -hmm. Are the great fallback position what God wants you to be doing uh, are simply idiots. And if you listen to them, you are simply an idiot. It reveals nothing. No one knows that. Those who know anything certainly do not know what you would be like and what you would do. And so it's all on the basis of different views that the, a, man's, a man's consciousness would have. But this is not to say what you would do, what anybody would be like once they see the truth about life. Based upon the great success enjoyed by the metaphorical story about the people who felt so yucky when they lived in Lapland and not quite as bad when they stayed in France and even less yucky when they camped out in Kenya, it simply encourages me to press on <laughs> along similar lines. Because I'll give you some hint. We're talking last time and now about distraction and the difference between even knowing the train schedules, much less reading them, but getting to where you know them. The difference between that and actually riding a train on such a consistent basis that you get somewhere because uh, many people know this from experience but I'll go ahead and tell it to you in a parable parabolically you can get on an extraordinary train you can get on the Mr. Express and you can get on it almost an infinite number of times within your lifetime for such brief periods of time that you never move I had to say parabolically because if you did that in real life in the 4D world, you would finally get somewhere. But even in that case, look how little it would be. That is, if you could, if there was a special train, and every time you could remember it, you were on it. But then as soon as you lost the awareness, as soon as right then you lost the awareness being on the train, you're off of it. Anyone who knows anything understands that under most normal conditions, your visits on the train would be about like that. <laughs> Now you can put that together, you can multiply that a million times in your lifetime. 
how far would you have actually gotten? Mm -hmm. From here to the corner? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm telling you in the real metaphorical, mystical sense, from here to the corner would probably be a charitable estimate. <laughs> The further down, and what I'm going to get to specifically, if this also helps, is people being entertained, people apparently seeking some kind of stimulus in life, and the matter of distraction. The simpler people are, the more that they're just red circuit wired, down somewhere in the development of humanity. The more they live down here, the less passionately dissatisfied they are with life. That's just a simple fact, always has been, continues to be. And that aspect of each human, to, to whatever degree it is still, it is active enough for you to be aware of it. Or conversely, if you are alert enough now to be able to recognize Lapland, France, and Kenya living in you, that you can recognize it within you constantly simultaneously is Eastern Standard, Rocky Mountain, and Pacific Standard Time. That you are in the complete state of human evolution. That you still have it in you. But the more you live down here, the more people are, the simpler people in life. The simpler they are, the less dissatisfied they are with life in the human sense. Which is the intellectual sense. Although ordinary people would call it spiritual sense, uh, whatever. Down here, any dissatisfaction of life, the simpler you are, the simpler the person is, any dissatisfaction they do experience, they find is fairly well managed by drugs. Alcohol. <laughs> the further you go up in the nervous system, if we get into the people a little bit more evolved, relatively speaking. It then actually takes a split that becomes, you might find some interest, this wasn't the point tonight, but down in here where you would find people of, they're not quite, at, in the ordinary sense, they're not quite at the intellectual level. They're not quite, their center of gravity, their main source of energy. Again, we're not speaking physically. We're assuming that everybody I'm speaking of tonight is wired up sanely enough that they are in a bio-survival mode. That we are talking about ordinary people, even if we're talking about just or very simplistic people, but they're still wired up that they're part of the general mainstream of life, physically and mentally, and all the other cases. So let's keep that in mind. We're not talking about the anomalies. When you get up in here and start moving toward the intellectual, people become less and less satisfied with life. Dissatisfied, of course, is just a word, and you've got, to, you've got your own experience to draw from to know what I refer to. The dissatisfaction, I repeat, is not of a physical, or it does not manifest itself in a meaningful physical way. Although people certainly are dissatisfied, we all know that with certain parts of life. And down here and up here you can have people who say, God, I wish my nose you know, was straight. I wish my ears weren't so big. I wish I didn't have a tendency to put on weight. They can say all of that. But that is not how the real dissatisfaction of being a human manifests itself. If that's all it is, then you are certainly here and you're at the bottom of here. Because that is no great dissatisfaction of life. When you get up here into the area that would appear to be getting, and I'll just put it crudely, people who apparently are getting a bit more civilized, and they begin to display what seems to be human emotions as opposed to just physical passions. And up in here would be the areas normally thought about as being those driven more by intellectual matters. That the energy that seems to be the focal point of their orientation to life is intellectual. Whereas down here, it's just the pelvis and the stomach, just the body itself. And up in here, it apparently becomes what used to be called, I guess some people still call the heart. This does not go in the normally expected sequential line because it takes a split. Up here, the dissatisfaction 
as, as you go up, it takes more and more complicated matters to apparently alleviate or to even react in an acceptable way to everyone's dissatisfaction with being alive. As you move up, what's required becomes more and more complex. Down here, as I said, even though some of you laughed, it was a fair representation. Down here, the dissatisfaction down here with simple people, and many of you have had the experience. We don't have to go looking for a trailer park and find examples because almost everybody, if you're aware of it, has some experience in this. At times, you just feel kind of you got the red ass. You don't know why. You just don't feel good, and it can be alleviated. I'm not, I'm not using this as a positive statement, but you go get shit faced. <laughs> and as far as you're concerned, the dissatisfaction you were feeling about, damn, I hate being alive, just that kind of feeling. <laughs> the more that you're just a good old shit kicking, brick laying guy from Mississippi with a third grade education, the easier it is. Remember, we're not talking about any sort of cures because ordinary people, there's no cure for dissatisfaction. But they can, at the moment, apparently deal with it in what they find to be a suitable manner in very simplistic ways. The simpler you are, the dissatisfaction can be alleviated at the time through fairly simple means, six beers. And if that won't work, by God, we'll get complicated. Twelve beers. All right? <laughs> but as you move up, it requires more and more complex treatments to even momentarily alleviate or to make acceptable to the individual their dissatisfaction. You get past here is where religion starts. Here's where civilization actually begins to take on a meaningful role. The institutions of life. Now I know down here, if they're talking by my own descriptions of the past, civilization, is they're already a part of it. If you're mentally ignited, if your brain is operating and you're verbal at all, then you're already part of civilization. But down in here, their participation in civilization is marginal. It's, all, it's almost enforced, or it's almost only the enforced degree is about the degree of their participation. And I was going to get in momentarily and show religion, as, as always, as being one of the prime uh, decorations and emblematic of civilization. And down in here, they do have some, you can call it religious, but down here, they will take the most simplistic. That's where you find uh, the shamanistic religions. That's where you find the so-called fundamentalist of all stripes, of all religions, because down, down at this level, if there's any religion going on, if the people participate in religion, they will believe the absolute, they will accept the absolute most simplistic, childish uh, piece of theology, rumor, myth. That's where it comes from. They're still in existence, but that's where you find There'll be a group of people, they may not show much in the way of religion, and some anthropologists talk to them and say, well, don't you people believe in God? And they'll go, oh, yeah, that's right. And they'll go, yeah, the, oh, what's his name? The witch dog. They'll say, that's right. You know, we, sorry, we forgot. We know, he tells us, there's an old God that lives three mountains over there. Yeah. But they have to be asked about it. And you can say, well, has anybody ever seen him? Well, no, and, but uh, he says, uh, our witch doctor says he's uh, 17 leagues tall, and he has green hair. And you go, well, if he lives over there, how come you've never seen him or anything? They go, I don't know, we don't know. In other words, if you start trying to poke holes in their religion, they just think you're, you're crazy. Because it's just you know, sort of a hobby. <laughs> the point being that they will take the most simplistic version of religion, philosophy of life. They'll take almost anything. And if you say, well, that doesn't make any sense. They go, have a beer. <laughs> they don't care. The gradual, the gradual <coughs> progression gets up into here, and the explanations needed. The further it gets up here, of course, we all know that people of an emotional orientation, intellectuals, we know that they drink, we know that they'll take a dope. But the further up it goes, the further up you go up in here, the less it is possible for a person up in here to be able to use alcohol on some kind of consistent basis as a relief for the dissatisfaction. They may do it, I don't mean that, but they cannot get the same sort of apparent satisfaction. They cannot get as blotto consistently. A man up here, a college graduate, a blue collar or white collar worker, mid management, getting blotto once a week or every afternoon, the three or four martinis, the classic thing after work. 
still will not do for him. And not doing the same way that this guy down here every night can drink two six packs and pass out on the couch and wake up and go back to his damn dead end job making just minimum wage. Too many kids, the trailer falling apart, his wife driving him crazy. And he knows it and he comes back in or next day when he's off work at four o'clock he feels like, you know, God life sucks. But suddenly, one of his good friends in a momentary flash of insight says, you know, stop and get a beer. And he goes, that's it. (laughs) All I'm pointing out is they can do it seven days a week. And it seems to, they can seem to live with it. The further you move up, it requires more than that. They can't get that from alcohol. They cannot get it from a simplistic philosophy of life. They cannot get it from a uh, animalist, from a simplistic, damn near uncivilized, mythological religion it has to become more complex this gets into the general area of the arts is where they sort of spring off I was going to say it actually kind of takes a split here because the intellectuals go into what's normally referred to as science that is they're, what they're seeking is the now remember we're not talking about the body even though I used alcohol down here I'm just showing how, some, how easy it is to deal with that because what we're dealing with in all this is not the dissatisfaction of the body it's inside. So once it gets a little higher than just your most simplistic, verbal, neurally active human on this planet. Once it starts here, it goes up, and let's take this first. But it, it increasingly requires more and more complex responses. Uh, complex stuff. Religion, philosophy, ideas. Science would appear to be, from one view, the, at the ordinary level, the zenith thus far. That men are supposedly looking for the cold hard facts. What is life? Even what's the nature of life? What, what constitutes the spark of life? What is not just the personality of man? What is the biological components? What are the cosmic components? That, you know, hard looks, hard searches for the hard facts. But notice... It becomes more and more complex. It becomes more and more complex every year. The, the more education, the more complex the person is, the more complex do they demand that the so-called scientific ideas or theories become. Notwithstanding the fact I know that now, well, it's always been, but that there's a continuing drive to discover the one theory behind everything. They say that, but notice the drive for that produces every year more and more theories. <laughs> it's just a fact. So the intellectuals, the further you go up and getting into the world of just the classic intellectual, to apparently, for them to apparently deal with their daily dissatisfaction, non-physical, requires more and more complex responses, more and more complex entertainments, more and more correct, uh, complex stimuli. It does with the individual to some degree, but it does, I'm really speaking of all of humans now, most individuals, as we've, well, you've had your own occasion to note, more or less give up the struggle and just live with it after the age of maturity. But still, let's speak as though it's, I can say as a one man, we're speaking of all of humanity. That the, the intellectuals require more and more complex stimuli to try and deal with the dissatisfaction. Greater and greater complex theories, possibilities to explain, to give some meaning to life, as it's normally called. And here you'd have people who, uh, to compare it with the science, the classic comparison would be religion. I could also use the arts, but religion seems to strike people the easiest to comprehend. The religion has to become more and more complex. It gets into real theology as opposed to just fundamentalist religious religions based on belief, which is down here. All that they require is that you come in somewhere and they say, do you believe in the great tree God? And you say, yes, I do. And they go, sign here. And you sign here and say, Say that you'll be faithful. I'll be faithful. Good. Glad to have you. And that's it. And that's all they want. It's not a fraud. It's only people up here that's more complex that will look at it and try to question it and say, well, how in the world can you put up with that? What do you get? You know, I, I, that doesn't explain anything. And they think, so. But the more you're up here, you think, well, it should explain something. And they go, hey, have a beer. You know, calm down. <laughs> But when it gets up here, it's past the, uh, the idea, idea of belief. It gets into, of course, like everything else, a more and more complex invented structure. And by the way, while I'm talking about civilization, if you look at civilization, it doesn't matter if we're talking about fundamentalist religious beliefs and 
that God is actually resides in a pond somewhere and he takes on the form of a frog or whether you're moving on up and it gets into extremely uh, complex theories of the cosmos whether it be religious or even philosophical of all the worlds within worlds and all the dreams of the Aristotles and the uh, Platonuses and the Buddhist, not Buddha, but the Buddhist it gets into that, and then an offshoot is more or less the same thing, but up into the world of physics, cosmology, theoretical physics, subatomic physics. But it becomes more and more complex. But also remember this, all of that, all of this thing is civilization. It is all inventions of men, and it all stands on exactly the same footing. <laughs> you know, which is everybody's agreement that shit stinks. Don't already, it's, it all stands on the same footing, which is no footing at all. It all stands on the same footing, which is what? I believe that's the king's new double-breasted suit there. <laughs> to varying degrees, people are seeking... Ordinary people. Some sort of stimuli. And at the crudest level, even with the crude people, and even with everybody else at the crudest level, the stimuli that they normally turn to, or most, is most readily available, is physical stimuli. Alcohol, even though it's a depressant. But it's still a stimuli in the sense that people ingest it, and it seems to do, that it affects some change within a reasonable length of time, a matter of minutes, and their internal condition. In this case, it affects their brain chemistry. So when I say stimuli, uh, that does not withstand the fact that alcohol is a depressant. It's still the stimuli that is, it excites in a different way the brain chemistry. All right, beyond that level, let's get that out of the way, we've covered that enough. We get beyond that and we have the normal world of entertainment, which includes religion and education. People seek, people, let me put it to you another way. Why do people go to movies? Why do people watch TV? Why do people read books? And if you ask that to an average crowd of educated, middle class, sane people of the world, you would think, you would suggest that you would get a myriad of different answers. Yeah, I know. But they are all the same. People do it to be stimulated. And they do it to be stimulated non-physically. They do not analyze it, and uh, if I get around to it, I'll even point to you, that people actually seek, by all sane observations, physical stimuli, when that's still not what's wanted. Well, I might as well do it now. Spectator sports is a great example. You could say, well, now there's an example of people not trying to stimulate themselves internally, not their inner life. They're not trying to affect their inner life. They simply just physically enjoy it. It's not so. You could say that riding a roller coaster, all thrill rides, is what didn't seem to go over all that well. The things about Disney World and carrying me back to old Orlando and theme parks. People, you would think at first, thrill rides. Great example. That there it is, that there's people wanting excitement in their life. Ordinary people. And it's like physical danger in a controlled environment in which they truly expect that they are safe. But it's the sudden thrill of going up and they'll... How? And everybody screamed like, we could die, we could die. <laughs> Whereas they feel assured that they will not die. They Certainly the body enjoys that. All such things, skydiving, bungee jumping, motorcycle riding too fast, whatever it is. The body certainly gets a thrill out of it. And none of this is any criticism one way or the other. But people do not pick these things out simply for, simply for the physical thrill. Well, unless we're talking about an extreme. Uh, this is all still, relatively speaking, because the more we're down to the very simplistic people in life, the greater satisfaction they get, for instance, out of a roller coaster ride. Which, those of you that still haven't figured out that life is truly balanced and just, if you go out to a, a theme park, I'm going to suggest I have never done a survey, but I don't need to. Once you know how life is, 
That's how you can speak about things that you don't know about and you still know about them. I've never done a survey, never read one, but I'll tell you this. Out in a theme park on roller coasters, if you stood there, there would be at least 99 bricklayers and people who live in trailer parks for every one person from the better section of your town, for every atomic physicist, for every person with a PhD in almost any subject except perhaps economics, and I don't get into that, <laughs> or meteorology. <laughs> There are going to be 99 bricklayers on that roller coaster for every philosopher, for every mathematician that ever passes through there. And now I've said it, you're probably hard pressed to find many physicists and mathematicians. I mean, there it is. Weird, huh? And people's mind goes, huh? That's why I said, weird, huh? Huh? I rest my case. People are seeking stimulation. They are seeking to affect something internally. Uh, I also cannot resist pointing out to you. If there was any place still on this planet, here it is, the 21st century, and there's always rumors, but just picture for a second. If we actually had a line that we could cut off here to where people start being civilized, and they actually found people, as they normally refer to it, still living in the Iron or Stone Age. Is, you know, somebody every 10 years claims they've just discovered one in the Philippines. I don't know why they figure on the Philippines. It's either there or, it's, of course, the New Guineas. Somewhere to, but that they have found a tribe of people that are ab absolutely, at least... 30,000 years behind the rest of us. <laughs> well, just picture this, or picture you, if you were thrown in such a condition. That is, that you are living subsistently, uh, a subsistent existence. That every day you had to get out, literally. Well, you can picture it yourself. Even if you had been civilized, if you were now dropped into such an environment. Maybe you'll like that one better. If in some way you could be dropped into the middle of a, a forest... And you, you found no way out. That you just seem to be stuck there. You do understand. You are someone, if there was some people still living below that level, and in the past there were people, you would not be seeking stimuli for your internal being. Well, if it's, make it simple. If you had to get up every day, uh, and there's a point to this, much more subtle than I'm going to say it because I'll get back to the main verbal map I was drawing, but here's the gist of it right now. I'll go ahead and give it to you. If you literally had to get up tomorrow, starting tomorrow, and every day from now on, you literally had to get up and did not know if you were going to find enough food and water to live, that, that you, were, you were living on that basis day to day, even if you had access to it. And this is not a matter of just time and free time. You do, you do understand that you'd have no interest in books, philosophy, movies, TV, music, civilization would mean nothing to you even if you had known it before. And when I say mean nothing to you, I don't mean just because you're now physically so far removed from it that's meaningless. You'd forget about it. You would not miss. Let's say that you went to the opera, faithfully at least, ten times a year. That you were a charter subscriber to the symphony where you live. That you faithfully, there was hardly a week went by in the last 20 years that you did not go to a brand, to a first run movie. That you, every year you read at least 10 of the number one sellers on the New York Times bus. That you were that kind of sophisticated, hip, educated, with it person. And at first you might think to be dropped down the middle of a forest and be stuck there the rest of your life. Let's say you're already 35 years old. That you've had that kind of rich cultural background. That you have developed the, that kind of love for music, literature, the arts. Good human conversation, the struggle, the debate of conflicting ideas, that kind of thing. And at first you think, well, damn, that would be, that would be the worst thing that could happen. I mean, it would be bad enough living out there in a jungle. But, you, the, but that would be worse. No, no, no. And you might first think, it would drive me crazy. No. Two days, I give you the most, and as though that would never existed. Think about that. If you had to get out right now, every day, and you didn't know whether you were going to live or not. 
And of course, I do this, and it's all a matter of degree. There are people living here in the midst of civilization in the United States, Western Europe. In civilized places, we all know this, there are people living in this country. There are people living within probably an hour's drive from here or less that almost lived that way. Regardless of how they got, you know, they, they just lived that way. And here again, would you notice life's beautiful justice? Is that not the people who are the least involved with the community, the arts? Nobody, nobody enjoys me. Well, I know I keep asking, don't you enjoy beginning to look out and see life? How about my cartoon for the night? Of a mystic staying up alone on a cliff looking out and thinking, one of the great things about being enlightened, at least you get relieved of the urge to save the world. <laughs> it's the same thing of enjoying the beauty. That, i put it to you another way. As you see, not only is everything just and everything's wound up, wired up just right, not only that, but it's funny once you see it because you never saw it before. One last shot before I go. Go to the poorest sections of town. The lower socioeconomic areas, as they're normally called. You do know that that is where you find such areas. They have the least likelihood of having a community symphony. They probably have no even amateur opera company. There's going to be probably no art galleries. Very few kids out in the yard practicing their violin. Very few well-known writers. Probably no bookstores. That's simply the way it is. And it's not right or wrong. It's not a criticism. That's the way things are. It's only ordinary people that go, wait a minute, we need to shift things. They don't understand the structure. They can shift the structure if they want to. Well, they can dream they can if they want to. But the structure is still the same. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about the area, the lowest, the trashiest, shabbiest part of the town, or the most affluent. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about people with a third grade education or several graduate degrees. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about Episcopalians or Louisiana Church of Christ. It doesn't matter whether we're talking about literate people, patrons of the arts, or those who are just barely literate. The footing of all of civilization, the footing for all of it, is the same thing. There is no difference. If you look into the, if you could see into the human mind, there is literally, it divide up into two parts. One of the parts in the mind, this is the ordinary intelligence, the ordinary mind that everyone has regardless of education, regardless of background. One of them is the mind of everybody. And the other one is simply the potential mind of you. But what normally passes for the mind, or sometimes I refer to as collective consciousness, is everybody's mind. That's what you've got. Everybody's mind is on that same footing. Everybody's mind's inside of a different shaped head. It's got a different face stuck on it. It can be a different color, a different sex, a different height, a different weight, a different age. But it's all on the same footing. For those of you taking important notes, I uh, will expect to pick that up next time about the same thing, but maybe that will help for the moment. People are seeking stimulation. That is what every form of entertainment is about. I'm going to have to quit beating around the bush now, as always, the last few minutes. Everything that people, that men do, that is not, survive, that is not directly survival-based, which most people who hear this, who see me do this, you, are, you qualify for, for that sort of person. That you are not living a daily subsistence existence. You do not have to literally fight and worry each day whether you're going to live or not and get enough food and water. Besides what every hour, whatever hours you must spend on your job, and of course some people are lucky enough that their job is part of their entertainment, but most people's job is a pain in the ass. <laughs> That's why they must get paid for it. But other than that, 
the rest of a, a, a modern person, a sophisticated person's time, is spent seeking to alter his inner state. For one reason, because his inner state is dissatisfied. He can satisfy his physical state, his outer state, so to speak. He can come home from work. Thank God I'm through with that. He's had two or three martinis there with the guys. Got a slight buzz. Comes home, has a good supper. Uh, maybe knocks off a quick piece with his girlfriend or boyfriend, whichever of you. And then after that, you know, it's still 6.30. Eating and, <laughs> and junk. And then the whole point is, the rest of a man's life, the point being, the rest of a modern man, a modern sophisticated man's life, other than the eight hours that he has to work, that he just considers, you know, it's gone. I just got to do it. Other than that, the rest of his time, and for whatever time is not spent actually in survival pursuit, sleeping, eating, etc. But the rest of his life, look at it, is spent attempting to placate, to alter it's in reaction to his, the dissatisfaction of his internal condition. That's what everything else, that's what movies are, that's what books, that's what TV, that's what spectator sports, that's what music, anything that is an invention of man is an attempt to affect the dissatisfaction of his internal condition. Just, all you got to do is look at it and you'll see there's no, there's no way out. It simply is a fact. It is not unfair, as I did already, to say that they're attempting to stimulate their internal condition. Uh, but I, and I want you to understand, that's why I backed off a few minutes ago from it, but understand stimulation has a wider, covers a wider, or has a wider connotation than just the literal stimulation of something to excite it. Because men will use alcohol to stimulate their internal state when it is a known depressant, which many drugs are. But the thing is, they, they have what appears to be this static internal dissatisfaction. That a simple man knows he can drink and get blotto and forget it for the night, but he knows damn well all you got to do is ask him, does alcohol cure anything? He goes, God, you know, you never had a drink. You're not serious. You can say, well, you know, just because you get mad at your job and your wife and you lay there and get drunk every night, does that actually make you any better? He knows, hell no, it doesn't. What else is new? At least I do it. It's always there. There is an awareness that this dissatisfaction in each person is a static condition. It's why men attempt to explain it away. It's why some men, the further they get the nervous system, they find it to be of some avocational stimulation to try and theorize about how they got there. Psychology. In the professional and the uh, non-professional sense. So people are just discussing the nature of life. People want to talk about themselves. It's like, well, if I keep fooling around with this, maybe someday I can unwind this dissatisfaction. I can calm it. I'll find out that there's some reason that I inside am just dissatisfied. The stimulation. People go out and to see a movie. Read a new book. They make a deal out of it. Now, I'm not attack attacking movies or books or anything. But let's speak movies being one of the great commonly experienced examples. You know, some of you may do it, that to some people, uh, the going to a movie is a fairly serious and meaningful experience in their life. And there may be a group of friends and they may get together and have a certain night of the week that they go and they may get together the day before and have a few drinks or coffee and discuss all the reviews they've read, the new movies, and it becomes a fairly important part of their week to decide which movie to go to and then later after the movie they'll discuss it. But they treat it, they will treat it with an, in an excited way that they'll sit there and somebody say, do you know Jack Nicholson or so-and-so has a new movie? Oh, I love him. And it's like, boy, you know, he can't make a bad movie. And somebody says, yeah, but I heard so-and-so. And so people comparing notes and you go, all right, and we all vote. Now you decide to go. And it sounds as though they are seeking fresh stimuli, that they're seeking to deal with the dissatisfaction internally, which is the higher end of the nervous system, mental, by getting new mental impressions, new mental stimuli, right? Wrong. All you got to do is have a pea brain of awareness to know that's not true. 
Everything's relative. I just have to stop and say it's not true. It has severe limitations. That is, people say, I want something new. By God, I want to see, I want to read a book. I'm sick of reading this same old trash. I want to read a book that's really new and really challenging and stimulates me. That's not true. Everybody knows that. All you got to do is hand them a book. <laughs> if you have any idea that you know that's not right up their alley or suggest a movie, that you've been around them enough about movies, and they're saying, well, that's one of the great things about movies. I hate telling people bad mouth movies. Sure, they make some schlocky movies, but damn, a good director, a good script, I mean, it's the kind of thing they'll start bringing out you know, Star Wars or ETs or I, who knows, I, whatever they, they'd say. There's been movies that changed my life, that changed my thinking. That's the kind of movie I like. And you say, well, okay. And after you hear what they're talking about, you, you say, well, let me recommend, and you recommend one you just happen to know about. It's, you know, it's an Albanian art film you know, was a dialogue done in Swahili, and it was based upon an outdated telephone book from Bucharest. That's the plot. You got me? You recommend that to them, the kind of people that says, movies are meaningful, I like a good challenge, and let them go see it. And the thing is, well, that's, I mean, that's too challenging. It's a thing that that's too big a shock. I don't mean that mean anything. I'm not trying to take up and encourage people to go see Albanian art movies if there were such a thing. <laughs> I snuck it into you tonight. That said that one man, after he finally gained an audience, after he finally tracked down and met Buddha, and got got to have a private meeting with him, after a little bit he thought to himself, he went, you know, "I didn't want all this original stuff. I, I wanted to hear about <laughs> Buddhism. That's why there is Buddhism instead of Buddha. That's why there is ideas of some great." Mystical work rather than people doing something. It's like, well, yeah, I want some shocks. I want some surprises in life, but, you know, not that much. <laughs> Think about it. Movies, the only way they keep going, to use that again, books, everything else, and man's civilization. The only way that the industry can keep going is to put out a new product. If Hollywood, using it as a metaphor for the industry... If Hollywood had put out one movie, or even ten, and that was it, you realize there would have been no movie industry, assuming it started in 1900. It had been dead by now. So the only way it can keep going is by putting out, apparently, a new product. Every week, for it to keep going and bring in the kind of monies, the return on investment it does now, they must put out some way, collectively, there's so many theaters now, etc., there has to be, I don't know what, 20 new pieces of product come out a week. Let's say 20 new movies. They have to constantly do it. There has to be constant books. CDs out. And people go to it on the basis of, I want to see a new movie. And if you tried to question them at all, they go, and I want to see one that's you know, exciting and fun. Now, people admit that some of them are simply mindless fun. If it's a Three Stooges retrospect or some, something like that, or a, <laughs> Just some dumb movie of some comedian, some slapstick. But they would say that they actually like films that offer some challenge. People say it. But they do not. Well, it's within very confined uh, borders. Because if they go see one that is more than they did expect. That is, I want to I see, see some kind of new movie. If they go see one that's too new, they won't like it. And they can't help it. So people internally. Now forget movies right quick. Men, all average sane men are continually, through the whole world of entertainment, through all the hours they devote in life, other than non-survival activities, the rest of it is man attempting, in a way, to stimulate this inner life. And the stimulation is meant to, in some way, alleviate, to ameliorate this dissatisfaction, or maybe cure it, even. On a somewhat higher assumed level is people reading nonfiction, reading serious material. And they say, well, I'm trying to. People pursuing so-called occult arts, New Age stuff, metaphysics. They go, well, I, I'm trying to, you know, movie's not going to do it. Well, maybe a few have you know, got mystical messages, but I, I'm taking up reading. That's more important, more serious. Yeah, they will until it gets into something, if they accidentally picked up something that was actually from the nine everybody else mind. Mm -hmm. And then it's simply, you know, that's too weird. They just... We got people are attempting to seek stimulation to their inner life 
and they overtly, from any ordinary view, you think they're doing it. They're out there seeking it. They're actively seeking it, and they're not. What they're seeking is that to simply placate what they are. Under the guise of, I want to be stimulated. Dog, get on. Go. All right. Unless I'm lucky enough.